Turn with me to Exodus 15. Uh, speaking of worship and celebration, this section of Scripture in Exodus is truly one of the greatest times of worship and celebration of all time because, remember, two and a half million or so Jewish people, the Israelites, have fled Egypt. They are at the Red Sea. Uh, we saw last time in chapter 14 how God brings them safely through. They're on the other side, and then now they're going to break out in spontaneous worship for who God is, for what he has accomplished in their lives. And, you know, what did God just do? Well, again, chapter 14 was all about the miracle of God parting the Red Sea and him delivering his people from Pharaoh's massive army. Now, remember, it was God who led Moses and all the Israelites out of Egypt, uh, they were down in the Sinai Peninsula somewhere, and uh, they go through that canyon. It's called the Wadi Watir. It's an 18-mile canyon, and it leads to the, the Gulf of Aqaba. If you look in your Bibles, you know, you get the Red Sea, and there's two fingers on top. One is the Gulf of Suez. The other is the Gulf of Aqaba. That's where they are. There's a wadi that goes through there, and they come to this beach called Nueva Beach, it's the only beach anywhere around there that would hold three million or two and a half million uh, people on that beach. And it's interesting from there uh, across that section, there's uh, uh, basically an underwater bridge, but it's 900 feet deep. It goes from 300 feet down to 900 feet. But each side of that, it's 5,000 feet deep. And so I believe, as we saw the videos last or the pictures last week, I believe that's where they crossed. But remember, the key of all this was it was God who led Moses and the Israelites out of Egypt through the Sinai down to this place where they had nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. Because remember, we saw God leading them with a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud. It says they went day and night. And so in three days, they covered over three or 200 miles in three days. How is that possible for two and a half million people? Well, it tells us in the Psalms that God uh, said none of them were faint of heart. And God gave them strength. And again, three days, day and night, three miles an hour, we could all walk that pace pretty much. Uh, 72 hours, it's 216 miles. So God gave them strength to do it. Anyway, they get down there. They have no place to go. Uh, but God brings them to the exact spot where he wanted them to be between literally a rock and a hard place. I mean, they're on this beach. They can't go back because Pharaoh and his army is coming against them. You can't go north or south along the coast because the mountains there, remember the video, those mountains go right to the water. So they're just trapped. And yet that was exactly where God put them. Uh, they, they had a, an army, as Josephus says, of 250,000 Egyptians that were coming after them. But once again, exactly where God wanted them to be, because now God could intervene in the most amazing way and deliver them from their enemies. And I'm pretty sure most of us can identify with um, many, of what, many of the things we look at in these scriptures, because I, I know I've thought, I'm sure many of you have thought, well, this is it. I'm toast. <laughs> I'm done. I don't see any way out of this. This seems hopeless. But then seemingly out of nowhere, Jesus delivers us. He rescues us. And all we can do is stand in awe and say, thank you, Jesus, for being so gracious, so faithful to me. So with Pharaoh's army barreling down on them, the Israelites start to panic. They're filled with fear. As we saw, Moses stands up before all the people and says, don't be afraid. Stand still and watch how God is going to save us. And deliver us this day. And these Egyptians, you'll never see them again. The Lord Yahweh will fight for you. And then God tells Moses, tell the children of Israel to go forward. <laughs> What's forward? Water. Deep water. Lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And so as we saw, Moses lifts up his rod, his hand, and the Red Sea parts miraculously. And I'm sure with the adrenaline pumping, two and a half million Israelites walk on dry land, it says. And they get to the other side. And on the other side is Saudi Arabia. Remember, Midian, Midian is where Saudi Arabia is today. That's where the Lord spoke to Moses in Midian. That's where Mount Horeb is in Midian. And so that's where they end up. It's a 10-mile crossing there at the Red Sea. 
and they get to the other side. Some of the guys that went on hikes yesterday on the Craig Crest Hill, yeah, we did six or seven miles. And it's like, wimps. <laughs> Ten miles, these people are going across this. And 200 miles there, I mean, you know, no. It, it was awesome. So from the Midianite side of the Red Sea, they look back, and here's Pharaoh's army, his horsemen, his chariots, 600 choice chariots, plus all the other chariots of Egypt. Again, 250,000 coming after them. And then God tells Moses, okay, raise up your hand again. And he brings the waters upon them and they drown in the depths of the sea. And then the, the Red Sea starts to settle down. It says there's bodies everywhere on the seashore. All the Israelites are standing safely on the shore, probably shaken, probably most definitely stunned by what has happened, humbled as they've witnessed this incredible miracle, this power of God. And, and that morning on the beach in stunned silence, they just stood there. I mean, how can you wrap your mind around something like this? I mean, how could you under, there's no logical explanation. You know, nothing like this has ever happened before. I mean, their minds must have been totally blown away. Hmm. Hmm. But out of the silence, Moses begins to sing. And just one man, he begins to sing, and this is his song. But I can imagine they probably were there for hours singing this song. He sings it, and then more join in, and then more join in. And pretty soon you got two and a half million Israelites. Wow, praising God. This is the biggest worship service of all time worshiping and praising the Lord. It must have been glorious, and it just gets louder and louder. And at the end of this, we'll see his sister Miriam. She grabs a timbrel like a tambourine, and they start singing, and all the women are dancing. And so this quickly turns into a full-blown worship celebration there in the Red Sea. Definitely one of the greatest miracles of all time. One of the reasons this miracle is so amazing is that the people did nothing. God did everything. I mean, God's the one that put them there. God's the one that opened the doors for them to go through. All they had to do was say, okay, go forward. Okay. And they couldn't do anything, just obey. They're like spectators, witnesses to this miracle. Uh, some commentators say that the Red Sea miracle is to the Old Testament what the resurrection of Jesus is to the New Testament. But the reality is Jesus delivered us, saved us from a much greater army than Pharaoh. Jesus has saved us and delivered us from the worst enemy of all, our sin. He's delivered us. He saved us. We contributed how much? Nothing. We didn't contribute anything to our salvation. Jesus paid the price in full. He did it all with his perfect spotless blood. But in both cases of their deliverance and our deliverance, it's only valid if you believe and receive the word of God. Could you imagine a few of the Israelites saying, you know what, I see the Red Sea parted. Yeah, we're supposed to go, but I'm just going to hang out here. They'd, they'd be dead. Jesus done everything for you. And you can say, wow, he did everything. That's amazing. But you don't ever receive him as your Lord and Savior. You'll be dead for eternity, separated from God. Chapter 15, as your title will say in many Bibles, the Song of Moses. This is the first song recorded in the Bible. Um, parts of this song, they're repeated in other places in the Bible. Psalm 118, Isaiah 12. Interestingly, you know what the last song in the Bible is recorded? You know what it's called? It's in Revelation 15, the Song of Moses. Actually, it's a two-sided record. Some of you remember records. Oh, yeah, I had a record back in the day. <laughs> so the 45s, remember those? So one side, the Song of Moses, flip it over, the Song of the Lamb. It says they sang the Song of Moses, they sang the Song of the Lamb, and it was all about God's deliverance. It's the tribulation saints. They've resisted the Antichrist. They, re they refuse to take the mark of the beast. Uh, the Antichrist is able to overcome them, kill them, because they refuse the mark of the beast. So they sing this song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, which is all about God's deliverance. It was all about God's righteousness, His judgments against the wicked. And above all, they're songs that declare the greatness and the justice and the truth of who God is. So again, let's take a look at this beautiful song 
uh, song of Moses. It starts in chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider is thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Uh, again, it, it must have been like a, a volcano. You know, slowly Moses begins to speak, and like a little puff of smoke coming from the volcano, and, and then it starts to get a little more shaking, and, and all of a sudden, boom, it just erupts in this massive praise service. Two and a half million people just worshiping, crying out to the Lord. But think, for 400 years prior to this, they weren't singing any songs. As slaves in Egypt, man, they had the joy beaten out of them. And so this was just all pent up within them, just praising, worshiping God for delivering them, for setting them free. But notice who they are worshiping here in verse 1. I will sing to the Lord. I mean, that's the heart of genuine worship. You're singing to the Lord. You're praising the Lord. You're giving the glory to the Lord. Now, there's a lot of good songs that, you know, are doctrinal songs, a lot of old hymns that are great old hymns, and a lot of them are just doctrinal statements. But to me, they're not really directed at the Lord. It's more telling us, you know, who God is. But true worship for me is just thanking and praising Him because it's a form of worship, obviously, it's prayer because we're talking to God and he's speaking to us through his word. Um, true worship. It's all about lifting up the name of Jesus. Now, of all the people in this world today, we have so much to sing about. We have been forgiven of all of our sins. We have been promised a, a place that Jesus is preparing for us in glory. And he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where you are there where I am, there you will be also. And so I cannot wait to see him face to face. He's redeemed us by his blood. He has brought us into this amazing relationship with the creator of the universe. Look at these verses in Ephesians 5, 18. It tells us, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation or wastefulness, but be filled with the Spirit. And that means continually be filled I love what D.L. Moody used to say because he'd always talk about, you need to be filled, you need to be filled with the Spirit. And, and somebody said, why do you keep saying we need to be filled? I'm saved, i got the Holy Spirit in me. And he goes, we need to be filled because I leak. I, I need to be constantly refilled. The Holy Spirit's always in us, but are the rivers of living water flowing from our lives. So be filled with the Spirit. And again, the evidence of being filled with the Spirit, he says, is speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're really filled with the Spirit, you're going to be praising the Lord, worshiping Him, giving Him the glory for the things He has done and is doing in your life. When we worship the Lord, it's like medicine to our hearts. Worship often softens our hearts. It prepares our hearts. It prepares our hearts for the Word of God. Uh, worship can cleanse our hearts. You know, worship is never to be a, you know, prelude to the worship. It's not to be, you know, a setup, you know, let's just warm up the crowd for God's word. No, worship is vital. I mean, what I'm doing now, this is part of worship. Everything we do is an extension of our worship. Tithes and offerings, that's worship. I mean, just living for Jesus, is uh, giving our lives is a living sacrifice. That means uh, an all-time sacrifice of worship that's what god desires so all the israelites they're focused on god at this point the natural response from people who are focused on god is to begin to celebrate him and worship him and unfortunately we as a nation have forgotten the great heritage that we have because of god we've kicked god out of just about every aspect of our society many schools in our nation, won't even allow Christmas hymns, Christmas songs to be sung during Christmas. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. After all, that would be a violation of separation of church and state. Boy, oh boy, has Satan had fun twisting those words around to the detriment of our nation. 
when Thomas Jefferson wrote about the separation of church and state, he was writing to the Baptists who were concerned about this new nation making a state church to oversee all of the people of America, like the Church of England, and they would dictate everything you had to do. And so they're like, uh, we don't want that here in our nation. That's why we fled these European countries. We want freedom to worship. And so Thomas Jefferson was telling him, no, no, there's a separation of church and state. We're not going to do anything against you guys. You guys do what you want to do. That was a separation. And now it's like you can't have church involved in anything in our society. That is 180 opposite of what Thomas, Thomas Jefferson was even saying. But again, what made this nation so exceptional was not because of the people living here, but the reason we were so exceptional was because of the vast majority of people in our nation loved and believed in an exceptional God. They were trusting an exceptional Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2 here. It says again, He is my God, and I will praise Him. The word praise literally means enthrone here. Uh, in other words, I not only praise the Lord, but I enthrone the Lord. Look at this psalm, Psalm 22, verse 3. It says, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. This is the whole idea where uh, you, know, you hear about the Lord inhabits the praises of His people. In other words, when we are humbly and sincerely worshiping the Lord, we're building, we're establishing a spiritual throne in our lives that only the Lord can sit upon that throne. And so as we lay our lives down to the Lord, we're putting God in charge. And as we worship Him, He is able to guide us. He starts to shape us through the truth of His Word as He continues to change us from the inside out. Psalm 37, verse 4, famously says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, that does not mean that God will give you a blank check to write whatever you want God to do for you. Now, there's so many out there, they think, just name it and claim it, and God's got to honor it. No, He doesn't. We ask according to His will, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will be done. You know, 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 and 14 is so clear. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us, and He will answer us. He'll give us a petition that we ask for. When it's lining up with His will, it simply means that if you delight yourself in God, and you're enjoying the fellowship God has established in your life, then He will restructure the desires of your heart. I used to say, well, I jokingly used to say, oh, I'm going to pray for a beach house in Maui. Well, praise the Lord, God didn't give me a beach house in Maui. It probably burned down. You know, I mean, God knows what's best. He knows what we need. Our flesh is wanting things, but God restructures the desires of our hearts. In other words, if you want what He wants you to have, you will receive what He has for you because He'll change your priorities. Instead of craving after fleshly stuff, you'll start to crave for more of the things that God has for you. And so our worship to the Lord must be without any hidden agenda. In other words, our goal, our desire, should simply be a closer walk with Jesus Christ, period. Uh, Matthew 6, you know, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these other things, they'll be added to you. In other words, as you set your heart and mind on the Lord, trust that He knows what is best for you. And that's truly what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, again, it doesn't mean we shouldn't ask the Lord for things. Even the Lord's prayer, you know, give us this day our daily bread. He knows what you need day by day. He supplies our needs. We thank Him for all the blessings He gives us. In fact, Jesus encourages us, ask, seek, knock, and at the end of that, it's in uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So He wants us to ask, but then trust Him to answer the way He sees fit. There's been a lot of times I've asked for stuff and God says, No. It's like, okay, you learn after a while, it's like, yeah, that's probably not what I need. I don't need that. God knows what we need. Well, look at verse 3. 
So I went, I kind of gave a, a different version of this last night at our men's retreat. And I'll just say right now, verse 3 was their favorite verse for the men. <laughs> the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Urgh. Yeah, they like that stuff. But like, I mean, that's an amazing verse. You talk about being offensive to a wimpy culture like ours today. I don't want a God of war. I want a God of tolerance. Or they say, I don't want an Old Testament God of war. I want a New Testament God of love. Listen, God is love. That's his nature. That's his character. The Bible is very clear. In 1 John, he's love. But God is also God of wrath. He's a God of judgment. God the Father, God the Son are exactly the same in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Same God. You don't say, well, I don't like that Old Testament God. He's mean. He's judging people. Well, we see the love, the grace, the mercy, the compassion, the forgiveness of God throughout the Old Testament. I mean, Noah found favor, grace in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, he could have wiped out everybody because we all deserve to be wiped out. But in his grace, he spared Noah and his family. After the flood, they grow, they develop, they rebel, the you know, Tower of Babel, and he could have wiped everybody out even after this. They're going to start grumbling, complaining against Moses, and at one point God will say, you want me to wipe everybody out and start over with you, Moses? Testing Moses' heart. Moses like, no, no, you can't do that, Lord. These are your people. He was interceding for them. But we all deserve to be wiped out, but God in his grace and mercy spared them. We certainly see God's wrath and judgment in the New Testament as well, especially in the book of Revelation. I mean, literally three-fourths of the book of Revelation is the great tribulation and his wrath and judgment poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world. But the Bible is clear. Both the Old Testament and New Testament, God is the same. He has always been the same. He is God. He's not a waffling, you know, not sure what I'm going to be today kind of God. He's not a Mormon God that's evolving. Interesting, you know about the Mormon God. Uh, it was Brigham Young that said, the God of this world was Adam and Eve. They were God and goddess. Because their belief is all male Mormons in good standing will become a God over their own planet, and they'll have all these celestial wives, and they'll repopulate that planet. That's Mormon teaching. The, the key or the core of Mormonism is their statement on eternal progression. That's what they call it. And it states very simply, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. What? what kind of God is that? And so when Joseph Smith would say, this is what God says, and then 100 years later, you know, whatever, President Snow or whoever it was, would say something 180 degree opposite. And you say, wait a minute, this doesn't line up. Why doesn't that line up? Well, our God is still growing. He's still evolving. What kind of God is that? How do you put your trust in a God that's going to change? That's the whole key of the whole scripture is God is the same. He doesn't change. I mean, Malachi 3, 6, God says, for I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. In other words, God didn't wipe out the rebellious Jewish people at that time because he made a promise to them. It was a covenant he made with Abraham. It was an eternal covenant, not based on their obedience, but it was based on God's promise. He's given us the same promise of eternal life, and it's not based on our performance. It's based on what Jesus did for us. And all we could do is put our faith and trust in Christ alone. Hebrews 13, verse 8, we're assured Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He is God the Son. So what he said on earth 2,000 years ago is still valid today. He's not going to change his mind about you. If you're a prodigal son or daughter, you've been living things contrary to God's word, you're in rebellion against God, but you are born again, you're a carnal Christian, but guess what? As a prodigal, he still loves you. He still wants you to come back to him. He wants you to return to your first love. He wants you to see that his arms are open wide to you, but you need to humble yourself, turn from your sin, and come back to the Lord. So here in verse 3, as a warrior, God will go to battle for 
his people. And I am so thankful that he goes to battle for me and for you. Because if God did not fight our battles, we would be toast. We would be history. Now remember in chapter 14, verse 14, Moses told the fearful Israelites, the Lord will fight for you. Interesting thing I found as I was looking up these verses was 285 times in the Old Testament, God is called Jehovah Shaboeth, which means the Lord of hosts. Now, when I was a new Christian, I heard the Lord of hosts. What does that mean? The Lord of hosts. Is he hosting like a party? Is he hosting like a tea? You know, what's he hosting? And then, no, and then he came to realize he's the Lord of the heavenly armies. That's the host, the, angel, the angelic beings. He's the Lord of the armies. I love it. We are in a spiritual battle. The devil hates us. The demons hate us. Most of the unsaved world out there is against us. I'm so thrilled that God is fighting on our behalf. Before David struck down Goliath, one of the things he cried out was, The battle belongs to the Lord. It does. It always has. And it's time right now as Christians that we wake up to the fact that Satan is going to war against our families, against our marriages, against our children. He's coming against so many in our schools. And as he's been very successful to put our society in all kinds of wicked practices, he's brought in all kinds of destructive agendas, deceptive programs. They're all contrary to God's plans for marriage, his plans for children, uh, pray for our brothers and sisters in California. I mean, so much wickedness. You know, Jack Hibbs talks about it all the time, where they're trying to pass a bill, and Newsom's all for it, that if a child, it could be a seven-year-old kid in school, a little boy saying, well, I think I'm a girl. They tell the teacher, oh, okay. And if the parents say, no, that's not a girl, that he's my boy, they can take the child away. They can literally take the child away and they say that's child abuse and they will put them in foster care some other place. I mean, it's just crazy the things people are coming up with. We're in a spiritual battle and so more than ever we need God to fight these battles on our behalf or we will not be able to recover. Now remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds so we don't go out there and start blowing people away with M16s or whatever. I mean, no, our battle is spiritual battle. We're told to put on the armor of God, and one of those things we use is prayer. Prayer is a very effective part of our spiritual arsenal. Pray. You might not be able to lobby here. You might not be able to you know, do these certain things like Jack Hibbs and others can do, but we can all pray. Don't ever think, oh, that's a waste of time. No, prayer. God hears our prayers, and he responds. I mean, he's amazing. Don't ever lose sight of that. Look at verse 4. Yeah, we got time. You got all day. <laughs> verse 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he is cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Catchy tune. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. Once again, we see the awesome power of God's right hand. Remember, we've talked about this before. His hand, it says in the scriptures, spans the universe. His hands, Jesus says, the Father holds you in his hands. Jesus says, I hold you in my hand. But the greatest picture of the hands of God are him hanging on the cross, nails driven into his hands, demonstrating his perfect love for you and me. Amazing. Whose hand spans the universe is also who parts the Red Sea. He wallops the Egyptians. I love that phrase, they sank like a stone to the bottom. So those liberal theologians that try to say, oh, they didn't cross the Red Sea. Come on, people, that's impossible. It was the Sea of Reeds to the north, 12 inches of water. Ooh, that's a big miracle. Yeah, the Egyptians drowned in 12 inches of water. What's a greater miracle? God drowning 250,000 Egyptians in a foot of water? Or God parting the Red Sea and they walked on dry land? I mean, it's just amazing that people try to diss God's word, 
trying to say, well, that's important. And they're the same ones that say, well, we're not really sure Jesus rose from the dead. He probably didn't really die. He probably just swooned in the tomb and was revived. I mean, there's so many silly arguments. Just take God's word for what it says. Believe what it says. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Wow, they're 12 inches down. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy. Verse 7, in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, I don't know why that's funny, but with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. Take note of these words. The depths congealed, interesting word there, in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, so this is Pharaoh's attitude and all the Egyptians, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Same thing Satan thinks about you and me. That's what he wants to do, but God is on our side. So Moses says in verse 10, they're part of the song. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Again, the Bible is clear that God the Father is spirit. Jesus says God is spirit. He doesn't have a body of flesh and bones. Jesus did. He's the incarnation of God. But God is spirit. Those who worship him, worship him spirit and truth. And so whenever you read descriptions where, you know, it talks about God's hands, his feet, his nostrils, you know, it's called an anthropomorphism. It's simply, you know, the supernatural attributes of God given human characteristics to try to understand God a little better. So the point Moses is making is that God thoroughly and completely cleaned their clocks. That's what it boils down to. The Lord, who is a man of war, totally wiped out Pharaoh's army. Again, look at verse 7. God in his wrath consumed them like stubble. Verse 8, the with the blast of God's nostrils, he parted the waters. I, I love this description. Again, the waters piling up like a heap. They were congealed in the depths of the sea. The, the word congealed, the Hebrew words used in different places in the Old Testament, and it refers to when you take milk and you make it into butter or cheese, so something liquid and it becomes solid. You know, it's also, um, you know, the water's congealed. <laughs> Last night, I think it was Steve said, you mean like jello? It's like, that'd be kind of weird, you know, wobbly jello walls. But he congealed the waters. And so some have described it like, okay, it goes down 300 feet and then 900 feet and then back up 300 feet and then up to the other shore. So you got like a 900 foot wall of water? I mean, I grew up surfing in San Diego. The biggest waves I ever went on, which was a mistake for me, was 15 feet. I mean, you can get crushed. You get rolled on the bottom, and, and sometimes you're not sure which way is up, and you're, like, trying to scramble to get up. I mean, can you imagine 900 feet of water just... Whoosh. That's why not one of them were, you know, saved. Not, not one of them lived. All the Egyptians perished. I mean... You hear all the time some of these professional surfers over in Hawaii, especially, they die, and they might be on a 20-foot wave, but because of the coral reefs, there, there's only like four or five feet of water and then coral. So when they get drugged down, man, they get ripped up. And, and can you imagine 900 feet? It's never been seen. Nothing like this has ever happened. Crazy. Verse 9, again, it gives us Pharaoh's attitude. I'm going to get you guys. I'm going to destroy you with my sword. But verse 10, it simply says, God blew out again, and all their enemies sank like lead as God covered them with water. And it was that simple. It was that easy for God. Inhale, exhale, God prevails. Catchy tune. Turn, us, turn that into a song. Inhale, exhale, God prevails. How awesome is that? Again, is there anything too difficult for our God? No. Is there any problem you might be going through that is beyond God's ability to sort out and fix? No. And whatever is wrong in this world, a day is soon coming when Jesus Christ is going to make every wrong right. He's going to destroy his enemies. He's going to establish his kingdom a thousand-year reign of Christ upon the earth will be in our resurrection bodies, ruling and reigning with him. I don't fully comprehend that. 
But praise the Lord, he is going to be in charge once and for all. That meek and mild Lamb of God, he's coming back and we'll come back with him. Uh, he'll be the lion of the tribe of Judah. So keep remembering who he is, fighting for you. Uh, look at these verses in Revelation 19. This is a description of the second coming of Christ. Starting in verse 11, John the Apostle writes, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. Here's the Lamb of God making war. Lambo. There you go. <laughs> uh, I must say that's an oldie, but I guess still a goodie. I don't know. So he's in righteousness. He judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Again, when we stand before the Lord, he gives us crowns. He rewards us. But what do we do with those crowns? We throw them at the feet of the Lord. He alone is worthy. So he's got many crowns on his head. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Dipped in blood in Isaiah, it's not his blood that's dipped. It's the blood of his enemies that will splash up on him. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Not only is that the angels, but in verse 8 of Revelation, it says those who are clothed in fine linen, bright or clean, is the bride of Christ. So we're coming back with him, riding on white horses as well. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So again, you know, Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, seriously, what's the very next verse? Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his only son, Jesus, but delivered him up for us all. Jesus, perfect in every way, sinless, the innocent lamb of God. God delivered him up, allowed him to be beaten, tortured, nailed to the cross, Shedding his blood for you, for me, for our sins. Amazing. He didn't spare his only son. That's his demonstration of love for us. Delivered him up for us all. And then Paul says, How shall he, God, not with him, Jesus, also freely give us all things? Amazing. So never forget, God is for you. He, he loves you. And it's not because you're so lovable. Seriously. He loves us in spite of the fact that we're messed up at times. We're prone to wander. We find ourselves in the mud hole. But again, praise the Lord for prodigals that realize even my father's servants have it better than this. I'm wrestling these pigs for carob pods. And it says that prodigal humbled himself and says, maybe the Lord, or maybe my father will take me back as one of his servants. You know the story. You know, he gets out of there, probably still stinks like pig slop and mud, and he's walking home, and it says his father saw him a long distance off. His father runs out to him, throws his arms around his stinky son. My son who is lost is found. My son who is dead is alive. He didn't condemn him. Jesus didn't come here to condemn you, but that through him you might be saved. We all deserve to be condemned. But again, he's a God of grace and mercy. He loves us. None of us are perfect. We still fall short of God's ideal for us. But don't ever forget Philippians 1.6. I quote it quite a bit, but it's a very uh, powerful verse. Being confident I hope you're confident of this very thing that he who has begun this good work in you, he began this good work when he saved you, will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. Until that day, we're still in process. Yes, we are justified. 
declared righteous. The moment you're saved, you're as saved as you'll ever be. But we're in this sanctification process. That's why when you look in the mirror and you go, eh, not so good, eh, struggling. Oh, I'm depressed today. Oh, I'm having a hard time. Because you're in that sanctification process, don't get stuck on that. Remember, you are justified in Christ. You'll eventually be glorified when you're out of this body of corruption and you put on incorruption. And you'll stand in his presence and you will rejoice for who he is, for all that he has done for you. So if you're feeling defeated today, that's okay. You don't have to live in defeat any longer because today can be the day that you stop striving and struggling to somehow stay afloat in this sea of life. And today you can start asking the Lord to fight your battles for you. And it doesn't matter if you've been struggling your whole life with some kind of addiction, some kind of fear. Today can be the day when you surrender to God whatever it is in your life that's been a problem you surrender it to him whatever it's holding you back and god promises you in his word that he will set you free he will deliver you he will forgive you he will restore you and he will start to use you for his plans and purposes once again well, look at verse 11 it says who is like you o lord among the gods who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? In other words, there is no God like our God. Think of all the gods out there that people worship. When we go to India, I mean, you'll see all these little idol little things, structures, and you drive by them and you'll see people that are offering fruit to them. They'll be burning candles to these idols. And they're creepy looking little characters, by the way. And it's like, what is that thing going to do for you? It's nothing. They have millions of gods they worship. It's crazy. And they're all like good luck charms. They're not real. They're not real gods. They're phony. There's only one true God. And then Satan, who wants to be like God, and Paul says he's a god of this world, prince of the power of the air, He's the one that's made up all these phony idols and images and gods out there that people go after. And it's amazing how many people follow after him, but they're all empty. They can't do anything. The Bible says they have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. Uh, look at this, Psalm 115, verse 8, goes on to say of idols, those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. In other words, just a, you're a dumb idol if you're worshiping idols. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't do anything for you. So stop trusting in all these other things that the world throws at you that are contrary to God and to his word. God has proved his superiority over all these pagan gods by totally conquering all the false gods of the Egyptians. Again, that's what the ten plagues were all about. Every one of those plagues targeted one of the main gods that Egypt worshipped. The tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, was an attack against the final god, Pharaoh. The Egyptians believed Pharaoh was a god, so he strikes down Pharaoh's firstborn son, proving God is superior over all these phony gods out there. Look at these verses, Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. What a contrast to all these stupid gods of mankind. It says, Who is a god like you, pardoning iniquity? and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever. Never forget that. Yes, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. But he loves you when he disciplines you. It's like any father, any mother, if you have a child that's going to wander off into the street and cars are going by, you're going to grab them. You're going to discipline them. It doesn't mean you beat them, but you teach them right and wrong. God does that with us because he loves us. He don't want to see us harmed. And so he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Aren't you glad? He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. Again, this is the Old Testament God, same as the New Testament God. You cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that the kind of God you want to fall down before and surrender your life to, worshiping him, and then also knowing he is fighting our battles for us. Quickly, look at verse 12. You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. 
You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. Now, the main point of these verses is to show them that God did not just want to deliver them from their bondage in Egypt, but he was also going to bring them into the land of promise. And that land is full of enemies, all these you know, tribal groups that he's listing here in the land of Canaan. It's God's land. Israel belongs to God. There's only one city that God says, this is my holy city, that's Jerusalem. When people say, oh, the Jews are occupying this land. No, it's God's land. He gave it to the Jewish people. Anybody else in there are occupying the land illegally. And so when the other people in these lands hear about what God did to the Egyptians, they're gonna, that's what he's saying. You're, they're going to be fearful of you. And this is why they should have just walked into the promised lands. They're like a week away. All they had to do was obey the Lord, get into the promised land. What does a promised land represent? It's not heaven. Don't think, oh, yeah, some of these old songs talk about the promised land being heaven. No, the promised land is a spirit-filled life in Jesus, the abundant life we have in Christ, walking in, in the fullness of what God has for us. It's the land where God will produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Because when they get in the promised land, is everything wonderful, peaceful, like heaven? No, it's one battle after another. They destroy Jericho. They get beat up at Ai, but then God just sends them all over. Now they're warriors, and they're taking over God's land. And it's for the people of God. And so it was a battlefield. It wasn't heaven. We're in a battlefield, and we need to be inf you know, infused with, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to have victory in this life. Look at verse 17. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling. Again, it will become Jerusalem. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, and now quoting from the first verses, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Amazing worship service. But guess what happens next? Within a few days, they get to the waters of Mara, and they grumble and complain, you just brought us out here, Moses, to die. Amazing how fickle we are. As you know, their journey into the promised land was delayed by 40 years. Why? Because of their unbelief. They failed to believe God's word. They failed to walk in God's ways and it delayed their entrance into the fullness of God's blessings that he had for them. But this is exactly why many of us fail to enter into the spirit-filled land of promise that Jesus has for us. Because just like God delivered his people from the bondage of Egypt, he has delivered us from the bondage of sin. He's delivered us from the death of this world. But God has so much more for us than just being saved from our sins. He also wants us to draw near to him, to praise him, to worship him. And now walk hand in hand with him as he brings us into the spirit-filled life, the abundant life where God wants to use us as his men and women, as soldiers for Christ, where he gets all the glory. But too many Christians are not fighting the good fight. They're not finishing the race. They're not staying on course. So what happens to them? Well, like the Israelites here, they spend most of their God-given years bogged down in the muck and the mire of this world. 
instead of being used by God to accomplish what God has for them. He wants that to start in your marriages, with your families, your place of influence. He wants to use you as an instrument of love, of righteousness, of truth to those around you. It doesn't have to be your life any longer to be wandering aimlessly, but God wants to bring you into that land flowing with milk and honey. That's why he plants you in the valley. You know, the guys, and I told them there last night, you know, when you're in the mountains, you have that mountaintop experience. Oh, it's beautiful up here. And everybody every morning is like, wow, it's so beautiful up here. What grows up here? Nothing. You don't see any fruit trees on top of the mesa. That's down here in the valley. That's where the battles take place. But God wants to produce that good fruit in our lives. That's where God will use you to bless others. It's great to have the mountaintop experiences, to be strengthened, encouraged, refilled. But now we need to humble ourselves before God. We need to confess our sins to Him. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Never forget verse 7. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. That word cleanses is in the present tense. It's an ongoing cleansing. He wants to continually keep us refreshed, refilled. Rivers of living water. You know, I know the rivers of living water aren't always flowing in my life. There's times it's like a little trickle, little you know, drip, drip, drip. And it's like, uh, it's a sign. I need, Lord, I need you to refill me. I need you to prune off anything in my life that's not producing good fruit. And, and we just come to the Lord. We ask the Lord to just cleanse us and refresh us. The Bible is clear. If we hang on to the things of this world we know are not right, then we quench the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit, as Paul tells us. And like the Israelites, because they failed to keep trusting God's word, they failed to keep walking by faith, they would spend 40 years going in circles in the wilderness. Shortly after this, in the book of Numbers, God will tell Moses, okay, take a census of all those men who can fight, 20 years old and above. So they go to all 12 tribes. They come up with a number, 603,550 men, 20 years old and above, that could fight. They couldn't fight yet, but they were going to be fighters. Well, you know what? Guess how many of the 603,550 make it into the promised land? Two. That's not good. Joshua and Caleb. They're the only ones that believe the Lord. They're the only ones that said, yes, God, we know you can take the land. We know you're going to give us victory. The other ones, they wimped out. Oh, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And they ran and hid. Now's not the time to run away and hide because we are in a spiritual battle. The only reason they spent so much time wandering aimlessly is they got their eyes off of the Lord and they put their eyes on their circumstances. And the more we just get consumed with our circumstances in life, the more cloudy it becomes to see God in the midst of our circumstances. And wherever you are, it might be pinned up against the Red Sea, nowhere to go. That's when you need to cry out to God. Don't let the same thing happen to you that happened to them. Let the Lord Jesus prune those branches that aren't producing fruit because Jesus says, I want to produce more fruit in your life. Lay anything and everything that's not good at the foot of the cross. Let me close with this verse. Put it up there, Acts 3.19. You know, this is after Peter's, you know, God used him to heal the lame man. He's leaping and jumping and praising God. And, and, and they're cut to the heart you know, after he preaches the gospel to him. And, you know, what do we do now? And so Peter says, repent, therefore, and be converted. That word means be changed that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Nothing in this world, no event, no getaway, no exciting thing you do is going to refresh you like God can refresh you. Yeah, it's fun to get away. It's fun to go do fun things. Nothing wrong with that. But don't look to those things to be the substitute for your relationship with Jesus. Only He can refresh your soul.
Refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord.